So I don't quite know how to start this video, so I'm just gonna dive into it. I recently moved and I came across some stuff from high school, grammar school, and middle school. And what I found in that move was I've had this since 1989. This is, at the close of grammar school, they gave out awards, and this is my Sense of Humor Award from 1989, AKA Class Clown Award, which was definitely my vibe um, at the end of grammar school. And this award is gonna be the focus of this video um, to share a little bit about what my childhood trauma was like. And we're gonna be looking that through that story, through the lens of sort of child development, what happens to kids, coping strategies, and eventually sort of healing. So why this is sort of significant is that, you know, the date is, um, is a funny ironic thing here is the date of June, what was it? June 13th, 1989 is when I got this baby. Um, it happened, I looked it up and it happened to be a Tuesday. And what's ironic about that is often when clients tell me their like daily chaos story of what it was like growing up in a household of like, you know, dad punched a hole in the wall on Sunday, everybody was fine and grandma came over and we put a picture over it to hide it and blah, 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 blah. And then there was just some huge drama on a Tuesday. I just kind of said, well, it's just a Tuesday. So a little side note, just ironic that it had, did happen to be on a Tuesday. So what happened on this day for me was, was a graduation of grammar school, sixth grade. There was an award ceremony. Um, my mom was there, I was there, and her best friend, which was a drinking buddy, who was a really sort of a mainstay person in our lives um, from the time that we were sort of really young all the way through sort of high school. Um, and that was mom's best friend. And dad usually didn't go to these things. Dad had narcissistic personality disorder and he was also sick with cancer which is another whole part to this whole thing. So in this award ceremony, I can't remember if I, if we went there as a little family or I was already there at school, but at the end of the day, they had this ceremony in the gymnasium, the same place where you get hit with a red dodgeball <laughs> and go through all that trauma. Um, and it was in that same sort of gymnasium that there'd be a stage. So like chairs, ceremony, you know, like sort of microphone. And then the, my teacher who I love, Mr. C, um, would be calling kids up. And I honestly didn't think I would be getting an award, which was my mindset at the time was kind of, I was really trying hard to be the cool kid, a little bit of the rebel and a comedian. So it was like sort of no big deal. I don't need one of these stinking awards. Um, you know, I wasn't doing well academically. I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't, there was nothing really. And I was desperate to become somebody because I really wasn't getting sort of good love, good care, or good identity at home and all that stuff. So um, that's, that's the main focus of this story is sort of being funny came the way, becoming funny is how I survived all that stuff. Um, so, and then he actually called my name and then he called my name for the sense of humor award, which is a nice way to say kind of class clown award. And I was both, it was a weird combination of feelings. So I go up there and um, I'm a weird combination of embarrassment and pride of my, proud of myself because it was really like um, being funny really worked for me and being a little bit of a pain in the ass in the classroom or being a little bit provocative. I wasn't a bad kid. I was just a really one of those kids. If you're a teacher, um, you would probably get this, you knowing one of those kids that does a lot of attention seeking and that was me. And I would do a lot of attention seeking by being contradictory or being funny or being whatever. And he called me up and, you know, he was really, uh, really loved this teacher. He's really sweet. He said something like, you know, did you hear about the one blah, blah, blah. And I got my award and I went down and then I went back to sit with my mom and she was like furious. She had that like, I'm going to kill you kind of look in her eye. You know, we, you know, a lot of you got to identify with like the stink eye or like the gritting through teeth kind of a thing. And it went from like elation to, you know, um, to her being furious at me. And I'm gonna try to explain my mom through this whole video, which she, she's kind of an enigma, like in a way that on a Monday, you know, she would have thought I was like the bee's knees for getting an award like that. But on a Tuesday, because she was either hung over or hated being there, or she felt like she was embarrassed, which I think is what it was, um, she was enraged. And she didn't make a scene in there. I just remember she just like, we're leaving, you know? And then her and the friend and me 
Um, I knew that, that I was in trouble and it was just like, we're leaving now. So we got there late and we left early. So then as we're in the parking lot, and I remember this in really great detail, because I remember the school. Uh What was weird about it, it was just the three of us walking to my mom's friend's car as she's berating me. I can't believe you did this to me. How could I didn't, you know, like you're, you're, it's almost like she was saying that I was kind of an F up and like I really embarrassed her and everybody else was getting better awards and like how embarrassing that I got that the class clown award. And the friend was a very codependent and I'll, I'll get to that later. And I just remember just being devastated, but I, you know, there's a, I, an interesting thing that around that age is a point of this video about sort of the age where kids hit puberty is we are, our brains are changing. We can think abstractly and we kind of know that something is really, really off. And this was the first, one of the first times that I sort of either stood up as best as I could with little power that I had. I stood up to my mom and I just walked away from her. It was like, get in the car, I can't believe you did this. And I'm like, probably looking at my shoes, just sort of clenched fist and just like, you know, huge feelings going through me. And I just walked away from her. And that really ticked her off. And then the friend is trying to calm her down and whatever. And as I'm walking away, is they follow me. I remember the street. I, I could tell you the drive coming out of like the, the school and I am just hell-bent on not talking to her. And probably halfway down that street, they give up on me trying to get into the car and they, they take off. And this was sort of, I decided to run away. And from that point is, you know, it was, I remember the, the weather was started to kind of like drizzle and rain. So the best that I could do was I kind of went by home and there was like a convenience store, but there was some tra like some uh, train tracks that my friends and I, we would just, you know, these are abandoned train tracks, so it was pretty, pretty safe. And it was like one of our kind of playgrounds was this train track that would go by a marsh. And like, we would kind of like chisel through this like slate rock kind of a thing down, down the tracks and stuff. So that's where I hung out for probably, um, you know, you know, June 13th, 1989, probably from like something like 3 p.m. till about sort of six. And it started to get like this cold, like sort of like late spring kind of like, you know, drizzle going on. And I remember I'm wearing a polo shirt um, and white pants. I don't know why. <laughs> like white pants in the 80s, right? There was like inexplicable pockets everywhere. Um, <laughs> and I'm sitting on these railroad tracks and I, you know, it's just like I realized like I got my pants dirty. But my thoughts were just like I, I didn't want to go home. And I was really contemplating, like, how can I keep this going? How can I really run away? And I think for most kids in that position, some kids are have a lot more sort of stamina than I did after the three hours as I was kind of done. But I think kids in that position, they realize that they don't really have a lot of options. It's too embarrassing to go to a friend's house. Um, you don't really, you know what I mean? Like I could have gone into the city, like I knew how to do that at that point, but it's just like, then, then from where, you know? So it's, you know, started to kind of get dark. And so I just decided to kind of put my tail between my legs and kind of go home. And um, I was just, you know, I think, I could only imagine what my thoughts were really like. I don't re actively remember thinking this way. I'm just trying to put the picture to kind of together. So I kind of walk home. And um, there's a very telling thing is when, when I knew that the friend's car was in front of the house is at, at that age of around, tw yeah, 12, 12, yeah, yeah, 12. I already knew that they probably had been drinking heavily because the car was still there. So already at that point in my life, I really knew how to read the signs of my mother's alcoholism. So I was hoping to just kind of like walk upstairs go to my room and just kind of hunker down there. And probably by the next day, due to a hangover or whatever, um, my mother probably would have forgotten the whole thing or it would have been, we would have been fine again. You know, my mother is this enigma of being bubbly and fun and very generous to being hungover and irritable then to being sort of like a complete sobbing, kind of emotional mess that you needed to kind of take care of her. So it was very inconsistent parenting. 
So when I, you know, got home and I kind of was looking around is I, you know, I went into sort of like the living room and my mother and her, the friend was still there and they had been drinking heavily. And my mother was sobbing uncontrollably and she had thrown up on the carpet because of drinking heavily within that span of time. And I just remember sitting there at the, like the entrance to this living room. And this is a big part of the story is that, um, you know, I, that wasn't, that was, you know, I probably saw that happen about like once every two weeks with my mother or once, once, once a month with my, she would very much binge drink and I would experience all that and experience the mess of it and the grossness of it and all that stuff. But the, the, that's not the thing. The thing was, is this friend, this person who was in our daily lives, they, he, this person kept saying, you know, oh, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Jesus having a hard time. Don't worry about it. And that had a profound effect on me. And I don't know, I couldn't have named it at the time, but as if this person was saying, nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. It's almost like being gaslit or that that was really about this person's emotions around it. And it's almost like if that person was a client now, <laughs> you know, and they were telling me that story or something like that, I would be like, what are you doing? What are you doing in this family's life? And what do you, you know what I mean? Like, what is, you know, it's like, I, I think a kid needs something different in that moment, you know? So being gaslit, not being really told the truth or making it to be about them or just really sort of saying your feelings about this, nothing to see here, smoke and mirrors kind of stuff. And probably as I looked at this, you know, in this, in this moment, and this was, this happened a lot. So it's not like it was anything really new to me, but I just remember this day specifically is a weird combination of really being disgusted. Um, she was sobbing cause she knew she did something wrong. And you know, it's like, she wanted to sort of, she was just a hot mess and she was trying to talk to me. And I just, Again, I kind of turned my back on her because it was just sort of like I didn't, I wasn't going to put myself available to that sort of again after what she did. And I'll explain why. Um, you could probably get why, you know, just it wouldn't be, even if there wasn't the award, that would be enough for a kid to get really, really upset at their parents about that. But so that's really what this, and I just remember sort of probably freezing a little bit and then just not knowing, you know, and I just went to my room and that was probably the end of, that's really the end of the story. And that was the close of grammar school. And that was sort of the start to a summer where um, the beginnings of sort of the summer before middle school, middle school was a whole other bunch of Tuesdays within that. After that, high school was a whole other array of really hard Tuesdays within that as well. And what, you know, the takeaway, what, you know, let's just say on that Wednesday, most likely is um, my mom might have like sort of taken me to get a toy and not talked about it. Or she might have been totally MIA for two days, not not because of what she did with me, but just just because. Or, you know, there was, but here's what didn't happen. There was never really talked about. There was never sort of an acknowledgement that she had a problem. There was, you know, my, my father would only be more upset that she didn't put dinner on the table. You know what I mean? That kind of guy, just sort of like totally self-consumed and, you know, like as, you know, she was not in a good marriage, but she didn't really do anything sort of about that. So there was really, my point is, is on a Wednesday, there's really nobody going over that whole situation with me. And I didn't start talking about that stuff until I got to therapy um, in 1996. So about seven years later when I was about 19 years old. Um, so let's get into why this award was so important to me or why, um, it was half pride and half kind of embarrassment. Well, you know, I was really not doing well in school and a little bit of the backstory is around second grade, third grade, um, I'm a child of neglect and I would start watching cable late at night and I would love to watch comedians, Richard Pryor. I could probably recite a lot of lines still from Eddie Murphy's Raw, Eddie Murphy's Delirious. There was Sam Kinison. There was even Ellen DeGeneres. There was all of these comedians. There was Stephen Wright, who I loved. He was like that guy with the flat affect. 
um, Robin Williams. There was like, you know, there was like, you know, um, specials for homelessness and a bunch of comedians together would, you know, fight homelessness. And I really think that that is really what saved me in my childhood is watching comedians. So when the school that I graduated from in the sixth grade is we had moved between third grade and fourth grade. And at that point in my life, there was already a death in the family. There was already intense alcoholism. My parents had personality disorders. They were, they were struggling with that. And my father then had gotten cancer around that time of this move. So this, little, this nuclear family was really sort of kind of imploding. And I had found the coping strategy of like laughing or getting attention. And it was just something that is where I think that every kid growing up the way that I grew up finds some way to survive. Could be academics, could be becoming the bad kid, could be, you know, drugs and alcohol, which was later, comes later for me in that part of the story. But for me in grammar school is being funny was the way to kind of get out of trouble or to get a little bit of love from teachers or to be acceptable. So between third grade and fourth grade, I'm this new kid. And in that fourth grade, in that move, which was a really devastating move for my sibling and I, um, I started, you know, those like Valentine's Day where you like take half the day off, you give, give Valentine's and you do cupcakes and you just like a big sugar fest. <laughs> um, I started to get up and do comedy acts and I wasn't doing Eddie Murphy raw or delirious. I would just do stuff like Gallagher, you know what I mean? And I would just like sort of, they were jokes, it's kind of funny. Um, I would be telling jokes that I didn't understand, like jokes about JFK and the grassy knoll. And I'm like eight. The kids don't get it, but they get a kick out of me being in front of the class that I had the gumption to kind of go do that. So, you know, fourth grade, it worked. I was the new kid in class. I was bullied. And that sort of slow, I slowly started to get friends by trying to be funny or really trying to be out there. Fifth grade, same thing, even more so, you know, had a really good friend of circle of friends and stuff, sixth grade. And that's what kept me going. And, you know, the teacher and who gave me this award was this really great guy really, really great guy. And what was an, a, another important part to the story, here's my report card from the same year, um, is as a traumatized kid is I wanted attention from adults, but I didn't know how to respect them. And I would be a button pusher. I would try to get attention in that way. And it was, it, it must've been really weird for the teachers. Cause I think that I was a really good kid. I think I was a likable kid. I was a funny kid but I was also a pain in the ass. And, you know, um, around that time in the sixth grade, by that time, I'll just read sort of like throughout the whole year, reading C's, language art, C's and B's, spelling, B's, arithmetic, C's, science, B's, you know, home study, C's, um, art, I did pretty well in art, you know, um, Music, satisfactory, you know, it's like one of those just SS or, you know, needs improvement. Um, this is funny. Physical education ex exhibits cooperative attitude, needs improvement. <laughs> That's probably still true. I hated sports. Um, but, you know, he wrote this note, you know, in these comments in the, um, in the report card is, you know, Patrick has just recently started working at his ability level. I'm hopeful this positive trend will continue. That was in, the, in November. Patrick's skills are progressively well, but he is not working in his ability. That is something that I would sort of see in every report guide. In the old school days, they would just sort of say, doesn't apply himself kind of things. Um, I probably needed an IA, IEP, um, but didn't get one especially in. But, you know, um, he writes here, it's a matter of concentrating on the task at hand. When, I, when Patrick does concentrate, his work is outstanding. I think that that is a very telling sign. Sometimes if you find these stuff, guys, it can be clues into what kind of kid you actually were. This is my point in telling you guys this. What kind of kid you actually were compared to what kind of kid you were told at home? I read that now as a childhood trauma specialist that I was a traumatized kid and I couldn't focus. And my main thing was coping and trying to impress people or trying to make people you know, laugh. Um, the way that I was raised, homework was not, I didn't get any help with homework. There was really no sort of engagement from the adults, basic, basic things that healthier kids or healthier families kind of work towards. And also a point about my mother enraging at me is my mentor would say that it's a, it's a setup 
to, you know, they didn't check my homework. They didn't get me a specialist. They didn't get me a tutor. They didn't even read the report cards most likely. And when they did, it would just be sort of a rage fest. And I was showing symptoms of poor concentration. That should have been a clue that something was going on at a point. And it's sort of like, look back now, I was like, of course I had poor concentration. There were fights. There were physical fights between my parents. There was drinking, there was alcoholism, there was poverty match with like this feast or famine, spend the paycheck that you get on a Friday, just total mess. And, you know, there was also sort of, there was a death in the family in already in grammar school and then more problems later on. None of that was talked about, none of that was processed. Most of the family's mental and emotional energy was focused on going to a bar, and I grew up in a lot of bars. It was a major point of my sort of childhood. And lastly, he says in this report card, you know, good luck at where I was, where I'd be going in middle school. Um, and he says, if you thought I was rough on you at times, I want you to remember that it was for your own benefit. And well, I think what he's addressing there is that he and I would get into it, coming back to this respect thing, is I would try to, um, the way my family communicated with each other would be to jab would be to poke at people, would be like sort of sarcastically. And I was already doing that. And I think that he could see that I was a good kid, but I probably pissed him off. And so <laughs> not in a way that he would get angry. It's just sort of like, I was just, you know, already exhibiting signs as kind of, you know, attention seeking. I think you guys get the point of being sort of a difficult kid. And they often, they often say sort of a picture is worth a thousand words, but here is also a picture of me from that same year. And, um, Trying to not to pay attention, <laughs> super sensitive about the ears. Thank God they kind of grew in. But why it says a thousand words is that I've got this smirk on my face that, you know, you can see what I'm kind of going for there is I'm trying to be the cool kid and not take much seriously or try to be the wise ass or try to be funny in that way. Um, and I, I think that it tells how immersed in that sort of bravado that I kind of had going on. And it's also, also I, was a, I was a ginger, I had the huge ears, I didn't really have a lot going for me. I was cute, but I, I really needed to sort of have that persona going on in order to sort of feel that I was somebody, which is really sad. And I know a lot of us had to do a similar thing. Go kid. So there is, you know, that, that is the report card. And coming back to, um, the scene of seeing my mother drunk like that and had thrown up on the carpet and all that jazz is that was, you know, again, it was sort of a very common occurrence. But the main point that I want to tell you guys about this video is um, I latched on to, to comedians. I loved to laugh and I wanted to and like have that experience with other people. It became a coping strategy. It became the way that I got through the world and looking at the report card is, you know, I wasn't getting any help at home and I was already showing signs of trauma. So in that moment where my mother is raging at me in the parking lot of my grammar school in 1989 is there's two things I want to talk about here. There is sort of, there is child development around the time of puberty and also the issue of betrayal. So, the betrayal part is, you know, I, I kind of knew I wasn't getting what other kids got. Other kids, you know, like they got dropped off to soccer at the right time. I'm not saying that they weren't traumatized, but just sort of in a way that from what I saw at the time is other kids had more engaged parents. And that was probably true. And they, may, they might have had trauma in different ways, but they're, for the most part, this was a kind of like upper middle class affluent town. And we were like the scrappy alcoholic family, you know, at the, you know, sort of, sort of, near, no pun intended, on the wrong end of the tracks or whatever. Um, and the betrayal part was, is she was in, I think a part of me, I couldn't have told you this at the time, but I think that my upset or my indignant or like not today Satan moment there was that I got no help from her. I got no, you know, no good stuff at home to help me sort of succeed. And she was criticizing me for the thing that I was surviving with. And if you relate to that, if you grew up as that kid that would um, really achieve, and then the parent kind of says like, well, it was an A minus, that's a betrayal. So it, yeah, it's criticism, but it's also a betrayal in a way, like you're not getting what you need at home and then you're criticized 
for the best that you can kind of do. And the best that I can do, and I still, I'm still proud of it, was to sort of be able to get some attention and make people laugh. And it's not something that if you had asked me when I was an infant, would you want to choose that? No, I would have, I would have picked sort of like stability and love at home and sort of in being engaged with the parents and sort of like learning about the world in a healthy way. But what I came up with was it worked. And then she was really being abusive about the thing that was working for me. So it's a like, you're going to neglect me, but then you're going to criticize me for the thing that I came up with that actually works. And that's where that indignant kind of feeling came to. And it's sort of like, I think that happens for a lot of us. And the other piece about sort of puberty is like in, in the way that children's brains develop is I think around the age of 12 and 13 and 11, we can think abstractly. Had the same thing happened, say, in the third grade or the fourth grade, is I just would have took that message from my mother that I was a bad kid. But I think around puberty, our brains kind of develop into sort of to say, like, there's something off around my parent, or you're not going to change, or why is it always me? And it's both a good thing, but it's a sad thing. Like when we look at sort of teenagers or like sort of like those 12, 13, 14, and we just look at, I hate this when they say like middle, you know, like moody kids or something like that, those kids might be being abused and they might be, they, they may be starting to lose hope. And related to that, that's also something that happened to me. So, you know, that was that summer at the end of 89 into sort of 90. And then I started sort of seventh and eighth grade. And around that time, I sort of um, started playing music, started playing in rock bands, started smoking cigarettes. And my mother was a smoker, so I could steal her cigarettes. And I also sort of started to drink a little bit here and there. And suburban kids kind of do that anyway. But like I had such access to it at home from the chaos at home. And then probably between eighth grade and ninth grade, they started sort of smoking a lot of pot and moved into sort of drugs and alcohol. And as it went from making people laugh and attention seeking and that I probably still try to be funny, but um, a new coping strategy started to emerge to deal with all those things. And the trajectory of that report card that I showed you guys, that stuff didn't change. C's, B's started to become D's and to the point through the family's chaos and the childhood trauma and the abuse and just the instability of it all. At that point through those years, there was more drugs and alcohol and I barely graduated high school. And I remember we had to have a special meeting with the principal to allow me to kind of pass because there were so many absences due to, you know, due to drugs and alcohol and instability and trauma and all kinds of stuff. It's, I barely made it through. And, you know, and again, my identity from the time, from the sixth grade thing on and even earlier is my family taught me that I was really not going to amount to much. They didn't really believe in me. They, you know, they didn't, you know, there was just like the ideas I was going to work with my hands and there's nothing wrong with working with your hands, but it was just like they were looking at me like I was a lost cause. And dysfunctional families expect children to be amazing without any help, and which is another point to this video. So at the, by the time graduated high school and then my, that was sort of the last straw, you know, my father with, who had cancer had passed away shortly about a year after the family imploded even more. And, you know, I was, you know, I left home and I was just waiting tables and I got to therapy and I had an amazing therapist who, when I got there, based upon all the stories that I'm telling you in this is, um, you know, good jobs, academics, all that stuff wasn't in the cards for me. My thinking at best would hopefully be sort of be like a rock star or something like that, but it probably wasn't going to happen that way. And I would most likely work menial jobs and not do well in life. And the future wasn't really, and that was, that was my mindset when I got to therapy sort of at 19. And when I started to tell my story to this woman, this amazing woman, I got really lucky and she knew that I was bright. She probably knew that when like everything that is recounted, it wasn't that I was dumb. It wasn't that I kind of didn't care about these things because it's really that I, I really in that around that time, the sixth grade, I wanted to be the best in math. I wanted to be better at soccer than I was. I wanted to like sort of have a healthy home life. I wanted to have a good relationship with my parents and my sibling and all that jazz. It's like, I think it's what we all want when we see it from afar. And then this woman could kind of tell all that. So about, you know, it's interesting about 
um, she got me into individual, she got me into sort of a group with her, and then shortly after that, she said, you gotta go to college. You can't be waiting tables your whole life. And I remember applying to a state school in Boston, and I remember like writing the essay. It was as if I was applying to be the president. Like this was, I can't believe this is happening. You know, like I was just so keyed up about would they even accept me? You know, <laughs> but like, oh my God, would you accept me to state school? Um, I just, I'm not trying to make fun of that. I'm just sort of saying my mindset was so like a pauper, or you know what I mean, or like the village idiot based on where I came from. And then they accepted me. I started going to classes. I was sober. I was going to therapy. And I got a 4.0 in my first semester because I could focus, because I was working on myself. And then that 4.0 led to graduating cum laude. And then that led to um, eventually getting into a master's and getting sort of an MSW in social work as a licensed clinical social worker. And here we are today. And it was, it blew my mind. I, you know, it's sort of when I, you know, I, I'm forever grateful about the therapist that I landed with, the first therapist that I landed with, you know. Um, I was with her for many years. And she had that ability to be a parent for me and was sort of like, you gotta go to school. You can't be waiting tables in a fish restaurant your whole life. It still blows my mind that a therapist could see all that and then get me to go to college and to make those suggestions. And I, you know, it's just it's forever grateful for that. But so the point to all this, you guys, is imagine, and I'm sure that you will relate to this, is because of our trauma, we develop this identity that isn't good for us. It's just a survival identity that I'm only worthwhile if I'm funny or life is too painful, so therefore drugs and alcohol are necessary or I'll never really amount to much. And none of it is really, really true. To flip that script and really look at what kind of family system are you growing up in? What, how did they drop the ball about getting you like basic, basic developmental needs? And it's just sort of beyond, you know, my wildest dreams about where that all sort of shifted and where, where you know, I have a life that's second to none. Um, and it was because that somebody sort of believed in me. So I hope I did was sort of thorough with this with, with this one. I didn't, you know, like, I just thought I would sort of talk to you guys and tell you this story. And in a way that I um, hope you guys relate to it. And a couple things about it at this point in my life is, you know, I just see my mom as a really unfortunate sort of sick woman. I don't really carry any bitterness or resentment about it. Um, she's not in my life and for good reason, but my point to that is that once you once you do enough childhood trauma work, is I don't toss and turn at night thinking about these things. Like this had such a good sort of ending, and in a way that when I recount this in a way, it's not it's not something that still runs me. But for a while before therapy, is I was highly reactive to criticism. I, and the specific type of criticism, and this might be the most important takeaway of the video, is um, criticism that felt to me that was like kicking me when I'm down, which is a lot like that scene in the parking lot. So there are triggers that really kind of come, and you can't really fully understand those triggers until you fully understand like your own story in that way. And you know, I just happened to remember this one day. I remember a lot. I don't remember everything. You know, you know, you don't need to remember everything in order to get a lot of this stuff back. So, I hope that this story had an impact on you. I hope it was um, relatable. And I think that for those of us who are in this work, um, you don't really hear a lot of therapists disclosing about what happened to them. And I find that. Um, I relate to people so much more and I feel safer with people who have been through similar things. I'm not trying to say that that has to be exclusive, but I'm saying it would be, you know, the, the traditional sort of psychotherapy where there's something like the tabula rasa or something like that, the therapist is supposed to be a blank slate, is I think what people feel safe with me is I would sort of say I had a mom like that too, or I might say like, your mom and my mom should go bowling, you know? <laughs> I think that they would really enjoy each other about being victimy or martyry or stuff like that. And I feel like there's a lot of sort of safety in that. So I would love to see that sort of culture and therapy change a little bit about sharing our story because it just sort of makes us more human. 
Because um, otherwise, when I also got to therapy, is I, I was so riddled with shame that the therapist was way up here and the client is sort of way down there. And the therapist does have to maintain sort of some kind of level of expertise or guiding or stuff like that, but they can also be human at the same time. So I hope that this story was helpful to you guys and may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well, may you be peaceful and at ease and may you be joyous. Take care you guys.